And ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention. Is that on? Yeah. We will begin. I know you're waiting on dinner. And uh, I'm not the only thing standing between you and dinner, but close uh, to that. Thank you all for coming out this evening as, uh, as we commemorate the memory of uh, Chris Mattingly and we celebrate the 31 years of the McConnell Center and of course our Secretary of State, Mike Adams. It means a lot to me to see the continuing support of alums and friends who have come out and continue to help work with us in our joint efforts to improve the future of this Commonwealth. 31 years ago, Senator McConnell inked the papers that established the McConnell Center. And in those years, there have been 259 McConnell Scholar graduates. It's been a lot of, I've spent a lot of time waiting for this next number. Uh, keep asking Sherry every year if we got the $5 million yet. Uh, we've finally made it to $5.1 million in scholarships uh, awarded. Almost a million dollars in international trip experiences. $200,000 in graduate scholarships and special grants to McConnell Scholars, plus, of course, all of our experiences at retreats and seminars, domestic travel, books. As far as we can tell, about 65% of our scholars that are not otherwise in graduate school or in the military are residing here in, uh, in Kentucky. We've had 23 scholars that have made it to the top four in student government. We've had 22 Fulbrights, including our latest, who will be leaving us in just a couple of days, Lauren Roos. Lauren, God bless, good luck. In Thailand, it's on. Um, can you guys hear me out there? Yeah, I'll move this uh, maybe a little bit closer. We could list, um, all the Ivy League uh, graduates that we've had and those that have gone on to Oxford and Cambridge and been Borens and we could talk about our lecture series which is now top 60 distinguished speakers or our books or podcasts or conferences, um, the most robust civic education program in the Commonwealth, but that would take a long time so I just dropped all those uh, for you. Because we know that this program is not just about numbers. It's not about the metrics. It's about the people. The McConnell Center established us. We would not be, we would not be part of each other's lives if it wasn't for Senator McConnell and what he did, and President Swain, and Paul Weber, and the faculty of political science when they established the McConnell Center. Should we switch out? It's because of them and what they did 31 years ago that established what we have inherited, and we have inherited it, and all of us together have made it our own. I think it's very right that we take a moment tonight and we say thanks to all those people who made it possible. If the senator would not have signed that document and had that vision, that inspiration of a dream of a scholarship program at U of L, I know personally I would maybe have visited Kentucky, but I would certainly never have been living in Kentucky. I wouldn't know you. Most of you would not know each other. If you take a moment to look around and think about who's in this room, most of you would never have come to know each other. We would never have had our common experiences together, our common readings, our conversations that have transformed every one of us and given us all some of our most cherished memories. And by impacting us and creating this community, how many hundreds 
hundreds and thousands of other people's lives have been impacted because we exist as a community. The ripples of this program really are, I think, incredible. And the story of us is an extraordinary story that is continuing to be written by us here and our friends that couldn't be here this evening. Senator, you had this vision 30 years ago. You supported over these 30 years our growth, our evolution, our development. I can say personally, you've changed my life in very dramatic ways um, and very much for the better. But you've changed all of our lives. All of our lives, I think we will admit, for the better. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, would you please join me in thanking our founder, our supporter, Senator Mitch McConnell. Gary, uh, I kind of hated for you to stop. <laughs> first, uh, let me say that um, first Paul Weber and then uh, Gary Gregg took this program far beyond what I ever uh, thought might be possible. But in trying, I know how important this program has been in many of your lives. I want to tell you how important it's been in my life. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in an awful lot of consequential things over the years, having been in the Senate as long as I have. Um, by the way, you, you might not have heard what my first real break in politics was. It was my internship with Henry Clay. <laughs> <laughs> but as I look back over my long career, <clears throat> not only uh, 38 years in the Senate, but now 16 years as Republican leader of the Senate, and sort of rate the things that have meant the most uh, to me. This program is in a very small group of really consequential things that I think have made a difference that I've worked on over the years. And um, so the point I wanted to make is the important is this may have been in your life has been really important in mine as well. And it's sort of the gift that kept on giving. Um, we started out just sort of giving my papers to U of L, and I realized that was not much. Uh, and it evolved into uh, uh, what I wanted was a sort of a gift that would keep on giving. We do, in fact, my wife and I both have our papers here, and since some of you early graduates uh, aren't familiar with it. We do have a pretty fully developed archive and museum uh, as a result of that. But I wanted something that would just sort of keep on giving. And Gary mentioned it, um, the 259 uh, graduates. I had hoped that most of our graduates would end up living and working here in Kentucky. And I think that's happened as well. So um, thank you for coming back, you alums. And uh, of course, Gary, I think, really, really, really loves the military program. And I want to thank all of our military people for their service to our country. Let's give them a big hand. And last, and certainly not least, I want to talk a bit about Mike Adams, who I think you all have wisely chosen uh, to get the Mattingly Award. There, there's a lot of um, utter nonsense going on in the political world these days. Uh, people literally making things up and trying to sell them as truth. And it's been a particularly challenging problem in my political uh, party. 
Uh, some of you may have know, uh, may uh, be aware, but I'm not signed up to any of that. Uh, what I try to do in my job as Republican leader of the Senate is not that hard. Just tell the truth and work as hard as you can, behave honorably, and hope that more people will imitate, uh, emulate that. So we've had a version of that here in Kentucky. There have been some people who've run for office and been soundly defeated who decided somehow there was cheating going on. and. Uh, some of them have even coughed up a significant amount of money in order to find out that they got their butts kicked. <laughs> uh, um, it's utter nonsense and particularly vexing to those of us on the Republican side to see this sort of thing going on. Well, my, Mike Adams has stood up to it, basically, and uh, it's happened in a, a several different uh, situations. He and I short, share the distinction of having been uh, condemned by a number of county parties in Kentucky. <laughs> and um, I just want to say to you, Mike, how proud I am of you to, uh, you know, to stand up against the nonsense that, that uh, members of our party have been subjected to in the last year and a half. And so I'm doubly pleased that you picked Mike for the award. I think there's not only is he one of our most distinguished graduates, and by the way, if you ever watch CNN, Scott Jennings, is an omnipresent reality on uh, CNN. He's their principal political commentator. Um, and um, so you just heard a Republican recommend CNN. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Daniel Cameron is attorney general and aspires to be the governor. And whether you went into politics or not, uh, all of you are doing stunning Thanks. I could not be more proud of all each of you have accomplished. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and to participate in this and to congratulate you and particularly to congratulate Mike Adams. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You are not supposed to say in front of everybody else how much I love the military guys and gals that are here, but I, I suspect they know it, um, but I do. Our, uh, our military partnerships have grown uh, over the years, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that after dinner. But one of our programs that we, are, uh, we should be very proud of at the University of Louisville, because we're one of only a small handful in flyover country out here uh, that have uh, U.S. Army uh, War College Fellows Program. And we took our spot from Harvard, I'm proud to say, uh, nine years ago, I think it was. I guess it was eight years ago. Um, and we have our two, uh, we have two U.S. Army War College Fellows uh, with us uh, this year. And I couldn't be more proud to have them, not only with us, working with us at the McConnell Center, um, but here with us tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kimberly Pringle and Colonel Karen Rutke to stand and uh, be recognized. Thank you, Colonels. Uh, we are three weeks into our strategic broadening seminar, and this is, uh, I'll talk about more about this after dinner, but we are uh, in a transition where uh, all those folks in uniform here and I will be getting on a bus very early Monday morning <laughs> and heading on a tour that will take us through Gettysburg and down to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, where we'll set, meet up with Senator McConnell again in the, uh, in the U.S. Senate, uh, thanks to him and, and his staff. So. Um, Tonight, this is somewhat of a, of a, of a farewell uh, to them for, for Louisville. And so as a beginning of that, I would like, in the beginning of moving us toward dinner, uh, what you're waiting for, I'd like to ask uh, Master Sergeant Oscar Camberlin Santiago to come forward and take us to dinner, please. Absolutely. All right, so um, let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, 
we are humbly gathered in peaceful fellowship with our hearts filled with gratitude and thanksgiving. Thank you, dear, thank you, dear Lord, for giving, gifting us this unique, uniquely wonderful program. Thank you for the staff who work tire, tirelessly to enhance our learning experience. I ask that you bless this meal as we prepare to enjoy it. Please continue to cloak us with your protection and take good care of our families and friends. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If we could get back to, uh, back to order, you can, you can continue to uh, enjoy your dessert. There's a coffee station, water, uh, I think over, over there, uh, if you want to uh, refill. Uh, as, the, uh, as the evening goes along, feel, please uh, uh, feel free. Well, we are, as you know, you are here to celebrate the best, greatest Secretary of State in the nation. I have no doubt. I'm a little biased, um, but, uh, but I do think it's uh, true. Of course, I don't know any other Secretaries of State, but <laughs> I think he's the best, um, at least. Um, we have a few other important things to do before we get, uh, get to that. I mentioned, and the Senator mentioned earlier, our military connections and our strategic broadening program. We have 26, we have 26 U.S. Army soldiers with us tonight that have been basically uh, going through a program of being a McConnell Scholar in a very intense, um, small amount, uh, amount of time. These soldiers have been with us for three weeks, and they're about to go on an 11-day excursion with me. I happen to think, uh, literally, in the uh, coming out of the men's room down there, thinking about what my life's going to be like for the last 11 days. And <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to need hazardous duty pay for, for this. 11 soldiers on a bus touring the country, and after we've introduced them to Kentucky bourbon. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be something. Uh, they come from a variety of ranks and a variety of specialties, from infantry to aviation to cyber to psychological operations. They come from posts around the country and around the world. They've been studying philosophy and constitutionalism and the international environment, and I'm here to say that they have been eating it up. Uh, I am, as a taxpayer and as an American, I, will, I am proud to report that they are making um, out of every, they're, they're making the most of every single day uh, they have been here. And it means so much to me when I see, they tell me how much this program means, uh, means to them. I think they have shaken Louisville and shaken us for everything, everything we had to offer. <laughs> and Q, that, that laugh, man. There's nothing that makes me my day more than hearing that laugh out there. Because it might be the only one louder and more distinct than mine. <laughs> so um, I do love the men and women in this, uh, in this program, and I'm so proud that I know I'm going to call them a friend. Uh, for, uh, for a long, long, long time. Um, that stated, let, us, uh, let me ask them uh, tonight to, um, to stand, and while I am <coughs> asking uh, Major Antonio Randolph to come forward and represent them, the cohort of 2022, would you all please, would, would you, SBS Cohort 2022, stand and one more time be recognized and appreciated by the rest of us? Good evening, everyone. I will first begin by giving honor to all distinguished guests, the Strategic Broadening Seminar faculty, my fellow McConnell Center scholars, and to Senator McConnell in particular. To you, sir, it is my privilege to extend the most gracious thank you 
for not only envisioning and resourcing this endeavor, but staffing it selectively with the likes of Dr. Gary Gregg II and an amazing team. Let's give him a hand. I would also like to add, sir, that the facility itself is top notch. And after much perusing, <laughs> I discovered a significant commonality between us two. I, too, have a wife who has outperformed me in most regards. <laughs> Uh, this is by no means a suggestion for you to change the order of the names um, between yours and Secretary Childs uh, posted throughout the buildings, but do accept it as a keen observation on my part. Uh, to my brilliant cohorts, a giant shadow now looms behind each of us as a reminder that with knowledge comes responsibility, and with more knowledge comes more responsibility. The size of the shadow will reflect the measure of knowledge gained, and it will remain close to our beings in perpetuity, sometimes acting as a guide, a reference, or refuge. Other times, it will be there to challenge us to become the best version of ourselves, as well as share what we know both freely and liberally. So let us remember the lessons we received here, the instruction, the camaraderie, and the moments when the remarkable flow of good Kentucky libations were paired with intense discussions and a second whiskey rebellion was averted. <laughs> From our classes and our lectures, we learned some things. Socrates says, be inquisitive. From Plato, the idealist, we find solace in reason. Because of Aristotle, the realist, we have become familiar with the value of virtue. And then there are the themes we ought never forget, for which I will elaborate on. Compassion. We must temper our expectations and offer fair assessment to our democratic system while generously applying empathy to our elected stewards, keeping in mind that a perfect union requires perfect leaders and perfect peoples. Even still, and like a more perfect union, it inherits the burden of maintenance. Resilience. Stay with me, Oscar. Where you at? <laughs> keep up, keep up, keep up. Yeah. For those trying times, and like many of those who have engineered the past, we should borrow from the resolve of George Washington, the hope of Abraham Lincoln, the tenacity of Teddy Roosevelt, and the ingenuity of Franklin Delano Roosevelt to meet and overcome our challenges. Broad-mindedness is a big word. Who declared that deliberation had to be deliberate? In some cases, chance should find this moment on a street corner in a barber shop, in a PTA meeting, and even a homeless shelter. So we must go to these places with two ends in mind and a desire to find at least one, either compromise or greater understanding. Wisdom. Rational ideas must continue to be propelled into the ether of promise, which connects the depths of our souls with the higher ends of our cognitions. It is there that the frictions of eternal perspective make a choice on a matter in its formation or its refinement. Those grasping the higher rungs of reason and who choose to weld their efforts for the procurement of power must do so for the good of the common good. The leaders and the best are obliged to use their aptitude to aid in building the overall fortitude of these United States. The sheep and the wolf that Lincoln once alluded to in his address in the 1864 sanitary fair still exist, as does the mediator, the shepherd. But they all have aged in a better way with much intervention with technology. 
Liberty is still their point of contention, and although there is less threat of the sheep becoming lamb chops or the wolf a fur coat, they still have a long-standing grievance. But they are now more concerned with the threat of other sheep and other foxes and other shepherds that now clutter the pasture and most importantly, have no loyalty to their terms or care for their concerns. I leave you with this quote from the famous fleet commander and national treasure, Commodore Dr. Gary Gregg II. <laughs> no relation. <laughs> Democracy is like a bottle of good Kentucky bourbon. Keep sipping. Thank you. Somebody remind me next year never to tell the next SBS class about my Commodore story. Um, at this time, I would like to call on um, Tanner Morrow and Allie Wade, the current McConnell Center Chair and the immediate past McConnell Center Chair, to just talk about the Mattingly Award and introduce our award winner tonight. Someone's tripped there. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Uh, Senator McConnell, Secretary Adams, soldiers, scholars, uh, alumni, and guests. Um, thank you all again for coming tonight. It's already been a great evening. Though they could not join us in person tonight, we would also especially like to thank Chris's sisters, Ruth Ann Ratley and Mary Tabor, for joining us virtually um, to honor their brother's memory. Um, and they're on the, at the screen there. So thank you all for coming. My name is Tanner Morrow, and I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the McConnell Center. McConnell Scholars Council this year, though, uh, after what Anthony said, I think it might be the Chow Scholars. <laughs> 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 and uh, also of telling you a little bit about the background of this honor. So the Chris Mattingly Award for Outstanding Leadership in Kentucky, founded in 1997, honors Chris Mattingly, a former McConnell Scholar who exhibited leadership within the program at the University of Louisville and throughout Kentucky as a member of the very first class of McConnell Scholars. The Mattingly Award offers recognition to a deserving leader who the McConnell Scholars feel has made an exceptional leadership contribution to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. First presented in 1998 and named by Chris's mother, the award has recognized the dedication of 23 distinguished recipients so far. As tonight, we're honoring the recipient of the 2021 Chris Mattingly Award, selected by a committee of McConnell Scholar Program alumni and the 2021 Council. It is my distinct honor to introduce the 2021 Council Chair to present the award, Ms. Allison Wade. Allie Harold's from Anvil, Kentucky, in Jackson County, and graduated from UofL this spring with degrees in criminal justice and political science. However, this fall, she turned on her fellow cardinals and entered the Rosenberg School of Law at the University of Kentucky. <laughs> Who could do such a thing? Senator McConnell did. Who could do such a thing? <laughs> All joking aside, without Allie, none of us would be here tonight. Um, as council chair through two years of pandemic, Allie worked tirelessly to ensure that committees met, traditions were kept, and that Chris's memory will continue to be honored through this award tonight and for years to come. With that said, please join me in welcoming my friend, Ms. Allison Wade to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Tanner. That was such a lovely introduction. And I just first want to say good evening, y'all. It is an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be amongst my fellow alumni and amongst soldiers and amongst you, Senator McConnell. I want to thank you all for coming, and I just want to note that coming here, even though I've only been removed a few months, feels like coming home. So I thank you all for that. Like I said, I'm honored to be here, and I'm even more honored to introduce the recipient of this year's Chris Mattingly Award. As McConnell scholars and alumni, I know that each of us are familiar and fond of the phrase, from Kentucky or Kentucky. For the past 30 years, the McConnell Center has committed itself to strengthening our Commonwealth, our Commonwealth's people, 
and its students. When the scholar body sought to re-envision the Chris Mattingly Award, we knew immediately that we wanted to uphold this long-standing tradition and celebrate individuals who devote themselves exceptionally to serving Kentucky. Thankfully, we did not have to look very far for this year's recipient. Secretary Michael Adams embodies the values of the Mattingly Award. As a public servant, Secretary Adams leads with passion and strives to unite the citizens of Kentucky, which is no small feat in today's divisive political landscape. His professionalism and expertise was invaluable in serving as a voice of bipartisanship and compromise during the 2020 election, and it continues to hoist Kentucky into the national spotlight as an example of safe, fair elections and high voter participation. Prior to becoming one of America's most notable secretaries of state, Michael Adams was a McConnell Scholar here at the University of Louisville. Upon graduating, he attended Harvard Law School and then pursued an impressive, prof an impressive professional career that included clerking for Chief, Chief of the United States District Judge Hayburn, serving on Senator McConnell's 2002 re-election campaign, and serving as Deputy, Gen Deputy General Counsel to Go Governor Ernie Fletcher. Adams then took his talents to Washington, where he accepted an appointment as counsel to the U.S. Dep Deputy Attorney General. In 2007, Secretary Adams began his private practice in election law, where he became nationally renowned in the field. He has represented numerous national pol politicians, po political committees, and campaigns. In 2016, Michael Adams was appointed to the Kentucky State Board of Elections, where he served diligently. And in 2020, he was inaugurated as Secretary of State. We are so proud to call him a member of the ever-growing but always flourishing McConnell Center cohort. And we're constantly inspired by his commitment to duty, honor, leadership, and service. As a member of the nominating committee noted, Michael Adams' leadership is not loud, but quiet. In the midst of controversy and critique, the Secretary quietly but confidently led the state to one of its most successful elections in our history, and for that we are grateful. These qualities of ceaseless service and persistent leadership are what we wish to honor and cherish through the Mattingly Award. The McConnell Scholars and alumni have asked Secretary Adams to offer a few words about the challenges of leading in a divisive political environment. Without further ado, Please join me in celebrating tonight's recipient of the Chris Mattingly Award, Secretary of State Michael G. Adams. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for coming to my fundraiser. <laughs> I'm glad you found a venue big enough for one of my audiences, Cardinal Stadium. I feel like Barack Obama. In all seriousness, thank you all for spending a Saturday evening with perfect weather indoors with me. Let me say that this award is certainly an honor, but it's made even more special by the fact that I knew Chris Mattingly in life. He was from Livingston County, where my mom grew up, and I was from McCracken County, the neighboring county over, and we bonded over our common roots. No doubt he's looking down on us today, touched at how we've cherished and honored his legacy. As I've said to every prospective McConnell scholar I've ever met, and quite a few people besides, my experience here at UofL, and particularly in the McConnell program, changed my life. Indeed, made my life possible. Nothing else, not even attending Harvard Law School, did more to prepare me for my time in public service. Today, I'd like to share some lessons I've learned from my experience. I was asked to speak on the topic of governing in a nonpartisan fashion in a highly partisan time. If you've come for a speech against partisanship, I'm not your guy. I come not to bury partisanship, but to praise it. <laughs> Were it not for partisanship, we would have less accountability, <clears throat> excuse me, even less accountability <laughs> at all levels of government. Like the adversarial system, in court that exposes every piece of evidence and argument to scrutiny and counter-argument from the opposing side, partisanship in America and in Kentucky means that Republicans hold Democrats accountable and Democrats hold Republicans accountable. Were it not for partisanship, we would not have clear, 
ideologically based lines for voters to choose between, and thus no public mandate for the direction of public policy, and little ability for business and other stakeholders to predict the future of our economic policy or our allies to predict the future of our foreign policy and plan around it. And if you think we live in an era of celebrity politics now, try stripping away party identity from our elections and watch how our top choices for president become leading TikTok influencers. <laughs> when we say that we don't like partisanship, what we really mean is we don't like the tone and we don't like the immovability of officials on one side of the line to work with people on the other side. We don't like the polarization and we don't like the demonization of compromise. Today is Constitution Day. Yes, I know Dr. Mackey says that every day is Constitution Day. <laughs> but today is for sure. In my party, some of the people who proclaim themselves constitutional conservatives are the least amenable to or forgiving of compromise, blissfully ignorant of the irony that the Constitution that we revere and celebrate, one of the foremost achievements of Western civilization, represents a messy and at the time it was adopted controversial series of compromises. That takes me to the topic of rising above partisanship. It's never been easy. JFK wrote a book about it in 1956 called Profiles in Courage. Every generation thinks it has things harder than the one that came before, but I do think partisanship is starker now. Over the past few generations, American life has changed immensely, and primarily for the better. Our standard of living is up, bigger, better adorned homes, greater ability to travel, more leisure time, an endless array of personalized entertainment options. This increased freedom, which I celebrate, has made us less reliant on each other. That's a good thing. But the flip side of that is less personal interaction, less trust, less socialization, less empathy. Starting in the mid-1960s, Americans' belief in our institutions began to disintegrate. It started with the whiplash from the sunny optimism President Kennedy gave us about what government could accomplish, even sending a man to the moon. To just a few years later, the credibility gap President Johnson faced in his conduct of the Vietnam War. It's not all LBJ's fault, and it's not just the federal government. Churches, civic institutions, fraternal organizations, the glue that holds our diverse society together, all began a steep decline. The social revolutions of the 60s began to sort Americans into different worldviews and ultimately into different self-made communities. We began a slow but steady march into tribalism. And thanks to increased mobility, it's not just a social phenomenon, but a geographic one too. People with one set of values are moving to cities and inner suburbs, and they are becoming politically homogenous. And people with a diametrically opposite set of values are relocating to exurbs and rural areas. The result is that people live in echo chambers, not just online, but also when they step outside into their communities. In 1972, after President Nixon carried 49 states in his reelection campaign, New York Times writer Pauline Kael famously said, possibly in jest, how could Nixon win? Nobody I know voted for him. <laughs> Today, nearly all communities are as politically homogenous as 1970s Manhattan. The lack of cross-party association and understanding contributes to a negative externality I deal with every single day. One of my greatest challenges, in fact, unwarranted doubt in the election process. There's a reason I get trolled by Democrats in New York and California who say that there's no way Mitch McConnell could have been reelected. And from Republicans in various places, including Kentucky, who say there's no way Joe Biden could have been elected. We're becoming a country of Pauline Kales. Add in another factor, the internet. I think the attribution of all of our social ills to the internet and big tech is somewhat overdone, but they play a part in this drama too. The ability to obtain, review, critique, and spread information and I use that term loosely, in many instances has let regular people hold elites accountable. But it's also let regular people become elites themselves despite lacking expertise or qualifications or objectivity or even commitment to truth. And now they wield unearned and disproportionate influence in our public debates. With access to the public square democratized, 
Being heard requires building a large follower count. And what builds a large follower count is interesting, provocative comments and views. What's more provocative than anything else? Extremism. <laughs> and the more that confidence in institutions declines, the more that credibility, the more credibility that these extreme voices attacking our institutions have. And folks in the middle, they hear from the institutions, and they hear from the anti-institutions, and they see both pop up in their Google or Twitter feed, and they don't know whom to believe. Generally, they believe whichever source supports the things that they've already chosen to believe. Or worse yet, algorithms designed to monetize search results and clicks don't offer both sides at all. Add up this toxic stew of self-balkanization and reduction of the barrier of entry to political debate, and among other problems, you have a powerful set of disincentives for leaders to work together and solve problems. To reiterate, I see great value in partisanship, to a point. Some issues of principle cannot be compromised, but most of what the government does at every level does not pose apocalyptic stakes. We spend money, we implement programs. It's not all life and death stuff, but it gets caught up and impeded by the other stuff. Yet as the so-called big sort segregates us more and more, we become less forgiving of those who work across the aisle and even of those who work to solve problems at all. Instead, we reward provocateurs who don't aspire to govern, but instead focus fire on the other side in a permanent holy war. Increasingly, practical citizens with more center-right or center-left views are deterred from leaving the comfort of home and family and entering the already challenging but increasingly bitter and occasionally even dangerous maelstrom of politics as volunteers or let alone as candidates. Politicians, like all humans, respond to incentives. It would be unrealistic to expect elected officials to ignore reality and our professional self-interest or to vainly resist these trends and be washed out in the tide. I don't have a magic wand to wave away all these phenomena. We can't prevent them any more than we can prevent tectonic shifting. <laughs> all we can control is ourselves. So the question becomes, not how do leaders defy these developments and prosper, but rather, how do they acclimate themselves to these developments and survive? I'll tell you what's worked for me. And here, too, you'll find I come not to bury politics, but to praise it. The nature of the position I hold requires, I think, at least a patina of nonpartisanship. Without getting into individual personalities, I don't think it's problematic in the abstract to have a governor or auditor or a treasurer who is partisan, but the chief election official has to be different. That is to say, I didn't necessarily choose to be seen as generally apolitical, but I was willing to accept it. Add to that, my office has seen excessive partisanship before, and it was not a good look and did not contribute to public confidence in the impartiality of our election system. This all sounds restrictive, but really it's been empowering. It's given me a bit more running room than my colleagues in other offices have. I get a hall pass, to be fair, <laughs> to an extent. Let's start with photo ID to vote, the signature issue that I ran on and won on. This is seen as a conservative issue, although it has majority support across partisan and demographic lines. The focus of my first month in office was meeting with adversaries, adversaries of my bill and adversaries of my candidacy, to hear them out on photo ID. Certainly, they were all against it, and that was before COVID struck. I saw two reasons to reach out to them. One, I wanted to telegraph fairness and empathy to enhance public confidence in our office. Two, I knew they were going to sue me, <laughs> and I wanted to figure out their strategy. It worked. I tweaked the bill's language based on those conversations to ensure we were humane and non-discriminatory, but also ensure a win in court. While other states' voter ver verification laws were struck down over the past few years, I was sued three times over mine, and we won every case. And we actually got to implement the policy. I got the accomplishment that I wanted with my constituents held harmless, and the lawsuits actually helped me with my base. So the first lesson is, reach across the divide, and yes, compromise, but do so in such a way that both sides have a face-saving line of retreat, and you don't get accused of selling out. The second lesson is, 
you can't spell bipartisanship without partisanship. That is, only Nixon could go to China. My street cred on photo ID supported my request that the Republican-controlled General Assembly give me emergency powers to make what really were some pretty re remarkable reforms in 2020 to ensure a safe and, s and secure election at the height of COVID. Even more remarkable, they expanded the Democratic governor's emergency powers the same way. It became clear in the spring of 2020 that we were careening toward a catastrophe if we didn't reorient our election process very significantly and very quickly. A necessary part of the solution was to promote absentee voting. And at a time, really the first time, that this method of voting had ever been politicized. You can imagine the conversations I had with Republican legislators about giving the new Secretary of State in office less than three months at that point authority to suspend statutes and reinvent the election system from scratch during a critical presidential, senatorial, and state legislative election. You cannot imagine the part of the conversation where I told them that we had to expand the governor's powers concurrently. But it was true. It simply was not feasible to give the new Republican Secretary of State, employed some 18 years by one Senator McConnell, vast powers to remake the election process while Senator McConnell was on the ballot. The reverse was also true. Given the governor's appetite for claiming vast powers through creative interpretation of our state constitution, the GOP-controlled legislature had reason to pass a law establishing his authority to approve election changes, which he would claim regardless under the constitution. But they also tethered him to me, so we'd have to jointly turn the key on any change. Being a trusted conservative Republican got me powers to save the election. The governor line item vetoed expansion of my powers from the bill and left an expansion of his own. Here too, partisanship made bipartisanship possible. I let the governor have it with both barrels for playing politics and threatening to destabilize our election. And the fact that I'd not generally been partisan in my job or in my public remarks meant my criticism carried even more force. Although I was alarmed by the governor's veto, it gave me a way to attack him and solidify my base before I had to move to make changes and need their support for him. But I was attacking the governor from the center, really, not so much from the right, and public opinion across the board backed me up. The governor did something he rarely does. He caved, he dropped any notion of bringing a legal challenge against me, and he worked with me in good faith after that to save the election. The moral of the story is this. Bipartisanship can be a process, as it was in my first example, but it doesn't have to be. Alternatively, it can be an outcome of a partisan process. A third, success in policy is not just about persuading other policymakers. You have to persuade the public to accept your changes and to utilize them. I need not just legislators or county clerks to go along with reforms. I need millions of voters to come along too. In the spring of 2020, in order to protect human life and prevent a virus from suppressing voters or worse, we had to make not just make absentee voting more widely available, but also persuade an electorate that historically had voted 98% in person to use it. I had my own interests to consider as well. Polling in the spring of 2020 showed that my primary election plan was widely supported by Democrats and independents, but strongly opposed by Republicans. The people whose backing I needed, not just to be renominated someday, but also to be able to effectively do my job for the remaining three and a half years of my term. I began with a constitutional argument. Absentee voting is a right based in the Kentucky Constitution, right in the text, and it's been there since 1945. Some Republicans wanted then and still want now to abolish absentee voting. It was important to show conservatives that I was doing my job, faithfully executing the Constitution. And noting that absentee voting was in the Constitution also helped me detoxify it a bit. We implemented an online portal for requesting, but also for tracking absentee ballots so voters could track their ballots, or more to the point here, so that non-absentee voters could know that I was tracking the ballots. We did videos showing voters how to request, vote, and submit absentee ballots. Again, with an electorate that historically had voted absentee only 2% of the time, we needed some voter education. But this also gave me a way to subtly show doubters all the security features that we had implemented in this process from voter verification via ID at the front end to voter verification via signature check at the back end. 
I'd love to tell you that this is all about skill and strategy, but luck, good and bad, plays a role. As we were beginning to turn the tide, I got some unexpected help from an unlikely source. I was attacked by Hillary Clinton, <laughs> <laughs> among others on the left, as a vote suppressor. This was manifestly dishonest, as the record turnout later showed, but it helped me reestablish the trust of my base. Meanwhile, the governor and other Democrats, and even the Kentucky news media, pushed back on out-of-state criticism of our election plan. Attack from the Beltway and the coasts actually served to unite Kentuckians in defense of our state and support of our process. The end result was that in just a month, I went from two out of three Republicans angry at me for making absentee voting more available to 60% of Republican voters actually voting by absentee ballot. This in turn relieved pressure on the in-person voting locations and Kentucky was the first state to successfully conduct an election in the pandemic. Fourth and finally, be willing to tacitly acknowledge people's biases to persuade them of your argument. When I was at Harvard, we had an Oxford-style debate about the estate tax. Knowing my audience, my argument in favor of abolishing the tax was that it harms the environment by forcing the sale of family farms and leads to more environmentally, uh, environmentally harmful industrial uses of land. This was Harvard, so I didn't win the debate. <laughs> but I got a hearing I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. In September 2020, a poll came out asking Kentuckians by what method they intended to vote. About a quarter said absentee, and that was feasible for us to handle. 13% said they'd vote during the three weeks of early voting that we established to avoid crowding at the polls in the months before a COVID vaccine was available. 66% said they planned to vote on one day, election day. Had that happened, we could have had a humanitarian crisis, mass spread of coronavirus, and lines to vote until two or three in the morning. I'm not speculating. That actually happened in other states. First, I needed poll workers to reopen the polls. It takes an army of 15,000 volunteers to run a statewide election in Kentucky. I have a staff of about 35. You can do the math. Declining along with institutions and social interaction is volunteering. And even before COVID, Kentucky struggled to find enough poll workers. Because by law, I need an even match of Democrats and Republicans working every single precinct in Kentucky. I had to find both. And I used different pitches for each. To Democrats, I said, if you're against voter suppression, volunteer and help us open the polls. To Republicans, I said, if you want to get away from this mail-in business, <laughs> volunteer and open the polls. Being seen as nonpartisan gave me the flexibility to adopt different messages for different constituencies and speaking to them in words that resonated with them helped us recruit 5,000 poll workers that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So we opened the polls. We offered two weeks of early voting in the primary, but it was a flop. Only 10 to 15 percent of voters used it. Disproportionately, the voters who did not want to utilize early voting leaned conservative. Early voting, we concluded, was a better way to run the general election than encouraging absentee voting. So as with absentee voting in the primary election, I had to speak to these voters in their own language. In Kentucky, voters of both parties strongly prefer to vote in person. But this is more true, at least recently, among Republicans. So my messaging went as follows. Republicans, I get it, you want to vote in person. Now you've got several convenient days to do so. Sometimes I used a more populist tinge about voters being kept down by the man in the past and now being freed to go vote. Sometimes I talked about expanding access to the polls for working people. Nearly everyone feels they fall into the category of working people. <laughs> but in particular, blue collar workers who lean populist but conservative responded to this phrasing. These approaches worked. So did word of mouth as voters of both parties used early voting, liked it, saw it was secure, and told their family and friends. The result, of course, was a safe, secure, successful, high turnout election that both sides accepted as legitimate, even though the Republicans won the U.S. Senate seat by 20 points, despite being outspent, and picked up 15 state legislative seats. As with Hillary Clinton in the primary, being attacked by one side, as I was by Republicans in the fall of 2020 over our changes, enhanced my credibility with everyone else. And also, as with Hillary Clinton, the total debunking of the irrational fears, this time from some quarters in my party, ultimately strengthened me politically with that constituency, making me even more credible than I'd been previously. 
I applied all these lessons in getting something I believe is even more significant than rescuing Kentucky's elections in 2020. That is, getting in 2021 legislative codification of many of our changes to make them permanent, like early voting. I hope that the benefits to Kentuckians are obvious, but there was some benefit to me too. It kept Democrats from accusing me of taking away their newfound voting rights, and it rehabilitated me among Republicans to have the GOP legislature essentially vote to ratify what I did. The way I got everyone from Rand Paul to Attica Scott to support the bill as a subject for another much longer speech than I'll give now. <laughs> I'll just note in closing that it's possible to not just survive, but to thrive in doing the people's work in an intellectually honest way, as long as you get the politics right. Although politics can impede good government, it can also make it possible. And you can't spell apolitical without political. <laughs> Thanks for your attention, and thank you for this very gracious award. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You can stay up here, Mike. <clears throat> Um, Tanner and Allie, would you come forward again? We're going to have to call an audible here and, uh, and correct, uh, correct the record. Um, first off, Mike, I am as proud of you as I've been anybody I've ever known in public life. I thank you for your leadership. Um, and um, However, this cup was not, was not for the Mattingly Award. So, of which I have nothing to do with, but thanks for giving my gift away anyway. <laughs> Allie. So, um, you want to take pictures of us? Um, so, I had, uh, I had this, uh, earlier today we gave a mint julep cup uh, for Carmen Thompson, who's one of, our, uh, one of our teachers who passed away a few years ago, and we gave her the Henry Clay cup. Um, well, we also, when I had that made, I had Brooke uh, uh, make you a hand-blown uh, mint julep cup, because um, Mike, if you, one of his roles in, in life was for five years or so being on the board of the McConnell Center uh, as our alumni representative. And when he uh, was elected, then he moved off. And I thought this will be a new tradition is when, uh, when people leave the board, I will give them a mint julep cup. So oh, thank you so much. That's, that's thank you. I'll so. use it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the, uh, the Mattingly Award, which I should have pointed out earlier, <laughs> was at the bottom of the, uh, of the podium, and I have nothing to do with it. So that is a total alumni and student award, so I will let you guys present that and get a vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.